So I'm uh, Richard Bishop. I'm here to talk to you about concurrency. Uh, some of it in, about concurrency in Ruby, but what it is, what it isn't, and hopefully some things you can use uh, in your applications today. A little bit more about me. Uh, I'm a self-proclaimed uh, polyglot with a problem. I love programming languages. Um, I don't know if it's all right to say this at RubyConf, but if you're not looking at another language to play with, just to bend your mind in different ways, you really should. There's a lot of interesting stuff out there right now. Um, and a lot of them are dealing with concurrency in interesting ways, and that sort of had an impact on me as a Rubyist. Uh, and then away from the keyboard, I'm a huge coffee and beer nut. And it's great that this is in San Diego, because I used to live here. And we also have the best beer in the world, in my opinion. So if you're out and you see some local beer, try it. But don't drink too much, because you are at a conference, and you don't want to make a fool out of yourself. And since this is a conference, I've got to give a shout out to my employer. I'm a freelance programmer. <laughs> uh, we are not hiring. <laughs> So for me, learning about concurrency was actually an accident. Um, I like to call it the other side of Rack. Most of our time is spent on the app.call side. And then completely down the other side, you go into web servers and system calls. So one night I had this issue with uh, bind2. And at the time, I'm like, well, what's bind2? This looks like a method call. I don't have a method called bind. Right? Not even realizing what a system call was. And it kind of went from there down into these patterns that Unicorn and all these web servers implement. Um, but it's a lot of fun, and Ruby is actually a great language for getting your feet wet in concurrency, because we have all the primitives. Um, and obviously, of course, it leaves you wishing you had more. Uh, and that's sort of the story with Ruby and concurrency. Um, but it's a good place to get started. So what I'm going to talk about today, uh, we're going to start with just some concurrency basics. Um, some of you are probably familiar with a lot of this, or others might be new to you. And we'll look at some practical uses of concurrency in Ruby. And a lot of the talk's actually going to be about abstractions, because that's really what concurrency is all about, as I'll explain in a little bit. And we're also going to talk about Ruby, because this is RubyConf. And that might sound weird, but probably about 80% of this talk is about concurrency in general. And then the other 20% is going to be about that as it sort of relates to Ruby specifically. But concurrency is a huge, huge topic. Um, so I have a not agenda as well. <laughs> uh, a lot of talks like concurrency start off with spawning some threads and then seeing how quickly you can put a million integers into an array. That's not really exciting. It's <laughs> it never got me interested in concurrency, and that's parallelism anyway. And we'll talk about those differences later. I'm not going to bash the gill, because that gets done a lot. Um, it's here. Deal with it. <laughs> We're mostly I.O. bound anyway. And I'm not going to look at a bunch of other runtimes. As Rubyists, we're pretty spoiled. We get to run our code on like five different runtimes. But each one of those could be a talk all by itself. So why should we care about concurrency? So we all know, right, we've, if you've heard of the, the free lunch is over, we're in a multi-core world. Um, we need to get more out of our hardware. As Rubyists, we love forking. It's really expensive. Um, maybe if you don't get the server bill every month, you don't care. But uh, I think we should be getting the most out of our hardware. Another one is better user experience. If you look at highly concurrent parallel runtimes, um, they're very consistent in their response times. They don't have these crazy 99th percentiles or, or long tail latencies right, that are really important. Like we just, you can't just look at the request per second or the average response time. You have to look at the whole picture. And the last one was a huge surprise to me as I learning, started to learn more and more about concurrency. But, um, you actually see some better design when you design your programs concurrently. So let's get into uh, what concurrency is anyway. Oh, first, let's just, just get this out of the way. So this is George Souk here. I think he probably thinks that concurrency came from aliens. <laughs> but uh, concurrency is really confusing because just to start, it gets confused with something related known as parallelism. But they're actually quite different. But thankfully, in the last couple years, a good definition has surfaced. It comes from Rob Pike, 
He's one of the creators of Go and he's done a lot of great Unix stuff. So this is what Rob has to say about concurrency. So he says concurrency is about dealing with lots of things at once. Parallelism is about doing lots of things at once. So that's a pretty good definition. But if you're like me, the first time I saw that, now I knew what it wasn't, but I, didn't, I still didn't really know what it was. There's not really any context around it. So to look at, uh, make this a little more concrete, I think most of us are application developers. So first, to look at parallelism. If you're on a, a multi-core computer and you're using threads or lots of processes, with several cores, um, those can actually be all CPU bound up to the, the number of cores that you have at the same time. But the big thing is those are just points of execution. There's no sort of communication happening between those things. Right? So like in the case of a web server, your, your request is a boundary. For concurrency, I think a good example would be batch processing. Uh, even on something like MRI, you could you know, fire up 30 sidekick processors. They're not all actually using CPU time at the same time, um, but they are running concurrently. And if you're batching, there can be communication with, uh, say there's a parent job, they can update with failure or success, or when they're all done, something else can happen. But there's a lot of communication. And there's multiple points of execution, but they're not, it has nothing to do with time overlap. So the reason there's a lot of focus on concurrency right now is that we want the benefits of parallelism, but we want it in a clear, concise way. So what concurrency is really about are these two things, composition and communication. So it's at the intersection of performance and clarity. And that's why there's tons and tons of different models for how to do it. So before I really get into the talk, while I was working on this presentation, there was this tweet that came across. I'm not really a tweet quoter, but I decided to throw this one in here. So it says, programmers love two things, making generalizations and dismissing other people's generalizations because they're outliers and accept. <laughs> so the reason I'm sharing this is concurrency is a huge, huge talk. In 45 minutes, I can't possibly cover everything there is about it. You might have uh, experiences already or experiences in the future that don't fit in with what I'm going to say. But there's just a lot to know, uh, and I can't possibly cover it all. So with concurrency, there's just covering the basics. There's three things that were, were given by operating systems and, and by hardware developers. That's processes, threads, and events. Um, these are the, the bare minimum that you'll have. And if we look at these in the context of parallelism, if you're on a multi-core computer, again, not Ruby specific, with processes, you'll have CPU and I.O. parallelism. And with threads, you'll have the same. So events are kernel events. Those are only used for I.O. There's no CPU concurrency or parallelism with events. So this last column is communication, because that's really, again, what concurrency is about. And when you have lots of these running, you have to find a way to communicate between them. So with processes, we do that with inter-process communication. So on the same computer, that might be pipes or sockets, or message queues, whatever it might be. But that's the only way to communicate between them. And with threads, we know sharing memory is how we communicate between threads, and we know all the perils that sort of come with that. And then events, there, there just isn't a way to communicate between them. They're just callbacks that you run, and um, as they finish, they get completed. Um, so with, with events, they need to be heavily abstracted. That's why there's that little Node.js jab there uh, by themselves. They really, really get unwieldy. Uh, if you look at languages like uh, Clojure and Erlang or Elixir, there's events there, but you don't even know it. It's taken care of for you by the runtime. So to recap the basics, so current concurrency is really about composition and communication. So the concurrency is how you structure these programs. And parallelism is how they're actually executing at the same time. And then we have these three primitives that we deal with. And we have these in, in Ruby, of course. Um, but this talk, it's about concurrency, but mostly it's about threads. So um, whether you like it or not, threads have sort of been chosen as the fundamental unit of concurrency. Um, 
we haven't really embraced that, so we don't have great support for it in Ruby, but I think if we get interested in threads and using them correctly, which actually means not using them at all or not knowing you're using them, um, then it becomes a lot better. So when I think of threading and concurrency, it's kind of like a lot of other hard problems that we've dealt with. So I want to talk about a couple other ones real quick. So the big thing is something has to be hard to do but important enough to want to do it. And if that's the case, we'll take care of it. So the first one is memory management. Right? We're all familiar, especially this year, with things like Heartbleed, how hard it is to manually, mem uh, manually manage memory. Whew. Uh, but that was abstracted a long, long time ago, right? Lisp was the first garbage collected language. Ruby's garbage collected, of course. We work, you know, a lot of the work we do is in garbage collected languages. Or there's other languages, too, like Rust, that have an interesting ownership model for dealing with memory. But the important thing is we have to deal with memory. Um, it's not important to know what's, you know, to be doing it yourself, but to know how it works at least. And of course, there's SQL, right? Who doesn't love a good SQL injection every now and then? But you know, in Ruby, right, there's query generators. We have Errol to take care of that for us. And finally, threading is hard. Some languages have great abstractions for that. Uh, Ruby doesn't. Right? Um, if you were to compare it to memory management, I think thread and mutox, or mutex are kind of like malloc and free. Right? We should know that they're, they're being used somewhere, but we shouldn't be dealing with that on a daily basis. But we, we, love, we love processes in RubyLand, right? We love forking and you know, using all that RAM. But it's expensive. And ex uh, communication is also very hard between lots of processes. I like to call it uh, passive-aggressive communication. You have one process send something to a message queue, and it doesn't know what other process is going to get that message. Like they're not actually communicating directly. And if you're not communicating directly, you can't co create really robust, composable things. But there's actually some libraries we can use today, thanks to our community. And I want to just look at a few of those real quick, and then hopefully get you interested in using them. So the, the first one I want to look at is called Celluloid. Um, so this is created by Tony Arcieri. It's a really, really great library. Um, if you're familiar with the actor model, uh, it's popular in languages like Erlang and Elixir. But the idea is you have these, this concurrency primitive. They're executing concurrently, and they communicate using messages. So that's kind of how we view Ruby. Some people say that methods are messages. Um, we'll see how that's not really true in a little bit. But Celluloid takes that actor model and kind of puts it onto objects and combines it into one really nice library. This is actually. This has got to be the most downloaded gem that nobody has any clue that they're using, because it's used by some other really, really great <laughs> libraries. And I think that speaks to how good of an abstraction this library actually is. It has some other really nice built-in things, too. You can create pools of these actor objects to, to do work. And then you can also create supervisors, which are a really nice tool for fault tolerance and reliability. So if we were to look at, uh, oops. An actor, it kind of looks like this in celluloid. You have this actor object. Inside of it, there's a mailbox. And then in that mailbox are messages. So the mailbox is really just a really fancy queue. Uh, and then as messages come off the queue, the actor processes them and moves on. And what's inside the, the, the message is just in, in celluloid is uh, the method that you want to call and uh, the arguments that you want to give to that method. So here's a really contrived example of using celluloid. It's a simple mix-in. Um, after that, you can instantiate an object. But as you see, you're not actually getting back your class that you defined. You're getting back it wrapped inside of the cell proxy. And the way that you communicate is, again, by doing messages. And you want to do a lot of this asynchronous. That's why you're using an abstraction like actors. So you call async, and you get back this async proxy. And then you can call greet on it. So, but I said just before that method calls aren't messages. And I think it's a distinction that needs to be made. 
So if you look at a method call, you have to wait for it. It's synchronous. So there is a way to get around that, right? You could do some sort of a thread.new, a fire and forget kind of manner. Um, but for a lot of reasons, that's not something you want to be doing in your code. But the, a big thing behind messages in the actor model is that they're asynchronous. You can make them synchronous by requiring that you get a reply back after you send a message. But you start off async, and you, it's only sync if you want to reply. So how does Celluloid actually do this? The way is through metaprogramming. So what you do, what happens when you call async and then you give it a method, async proxy implements this method missing and it wraps it in a call and forwards the method and the arguments on so that your program can move on. Um, and then that will eventually get called later. So the reason I wanted to talk about this library first is the next one that I want to show you uses it. And I hope everyone in here is using this library by now. Uh, Sidekick, it's tremendous. Uh, if you were previously using Rescue or still are using Rescue or Delayed Job, I'd encourage you to check it out. Um, so this is made by Mike Perheim. It's a fantastic background processing library. Um, you can, in a typical Ruby application, one of these workers can replace between eight to 20, in my experience, Rescue workers. And the one weird trick it has for doing this is it's multi-threaded. So even in MRI, threads are still useful because you have I.O. parallelism, or concurrency, rather. If you look at the design of Sidekick, though, again, it's using celluloid behind the scenes, it looks like this. So you have this launcher uh, object. And when it gets started up, you get a fetcher and a manager. And then the manager manages these processors, which are the things that actually uh, do the work of instantiating your jobs and running the code. The interesting thing about this, uh, there's two things in my opinion. There's really clear, visible separation of concerns when you look at these pieces, and they're all running concurrently. And that's because they're all actors, and they're all communicating with each other using messages. So the manager can send a message to the processor of a job to work on, uh, the fetcher sends that job to the manager, or the manager can request from the fetcher also. So this is a really great library. I'm just curious, who in here is using Sidekick? That's, that's good. That's, that's pretty good. <laughs> it's a surprise, almost. <laughs> so Ruby is also really popular among startups. And I know startups, you're all super, super busy. You don't even have time for stuff like concurrency. But there's another really cool background job called Sucker Punch. Uh, this is made by Brandon Hilkert, also using Celluloid. It's completely in memory. Uh, same API to Sidekick, so if you need to upgrade later, it's very, very simple to do. And you don't want to use Sucker Punch for obviously very, very important jobs, right? Because it's in memory. If your process crashes, your, your queue's gone. But for prototyping, and things like that, it's, it's, it's awesome. And the last library I want to show you real quick is called Puma. So this is a, a multi-threaded web server. It actually does forking as well, and it has a reactor inside of it. So this is like a, it's a concurrency buffet. It's got it all. But to look at the design of it again, uh, you kind of see these clear separation of concerns. On the right, you have uh, what's known as a thread pool, a very, very common concurrency abstraction. Uh, it's basically you, you'll have uh, a bunch of threads all sharing a resource, and they use uh, mutex, which is around this request queue, to uh, change that resource. And then on the left, we have this acceptor thread, uh, which is a, just a, a TCP server accepting requests and then handing them off to this, re this request queue that then gets processed by these threads. So again, very, very clear separation of concerns. That's what makes doing threaded like this possible. Right? If you don't create good abstractions for threading, it's, you're going to have a really bad time. Um, and another thing to keep in mind when you're doing these types of things, 
this, you have to keep an eye for, for potential bottlenecks. And in this case, that's probably the mutex around this queue. But realistically, not a huge deal because this is the real bottleneck in a language like Ruby. I think we can agree. So to recap, just this section real quick. This is all about abstractions, CC actors and thread pools. Uh, and I just wanted to show you some libraries that you can use right now, or should be using right now, to, to get better use out of your hardware. And the next section is the one that's really, really interesting to me as I've learned more and more about concurrency and have used some, some other programming languages. And that's uh, the design benefits that you get out of designing your programs concurrently. So right now there's, or as always, I guess, there's a huge emphasis on design, right? You hear so much talk about designing in the small or service-oriented architecture, um, service objects, microservices, whatever. There's probably tons of talks here about software design. So what design is really about is pain. When you're working on a single-threaded synchronous app and you have poorly designed software, the pain that you feel is unexpected bugs, it's hard to make changes, and um, just iterating becomes a, a bit slower. But you don't actually have runtime pain in a single-threaded synchronous application. So as opposed to a concurrent app, if you have bad design, not only do you have all those other issues, but you're going to have issues with deadlock, race conditions, and other bad things. So be knowing this, when you design an application for concurrency, you're a bit more brutal about how you design it. So I want to quickly talk about another language real quick. Um, I couldn't possibly introduce you to a language right now, but just some high-level over things. It's called Elixir. If you're familiar with uh, Jose Valim, this is a language he created. It runs on the Erlang virtual machine. If you've ever met an Erlang programmer before, they've probably told you how awesome the Erlang virtual machine is within the first five minutes of meeting them. <laughs> if you haven't, uh, now you know me, and the Erlang virtual machine is awesome. <laughs> um, Benjamin Tan Wai Hao is giving a talk tomorrow on Elixir if you're, if, if you're more interested in this language. But the interesting parts about Elixir, and Erlang for that matter, is they actually treat concurrency as a paradigm all on its own. So we think of a object-oriented or functional programming as paradigms, and they, they think of concurrency as a paradigm. And, you, and you'll really see that in the language. And it's also uh, using actors and message passing between them. When you look at an Elixir program, it has this sort of structure to it. It's, it's known as a supervision tree. And all these individual circles are actually running concurrently, and they all communicate using message passing. And the, the red ones are, are known as supervisors. So there's a big distinction in your applications when you write them. You have your, your library code, maybe your models, your parsing, or whatever it is. And then you have these implementations of these uh, concurrently running actors. And these can be pools. Each one of those circles could be, you know, in the case of a web server, that might be like 100 acceptor sockets or something. Um, on a pretty normal four or eight core computer, you can have 300,000 to a million of these actors running at the same time. It's, it's really insane. Um, as great as the Erlang virtual machine is, they're actually world class at having poorly named things. Um, so th this little structure here is called an application. Um, <laughs> but they're actu it's actually just a component. It's one piece of your application. Your whole application will look like this. Um, one part might be something that's accepting web requests. You could have web sockets for messaging. And then the Erlang world is nuts. We like to write our own caches. Um, it's just really, really easy to do in the language. So you can have these really, really application-specific caches. It's, it's pretty neat. Um, the interesting thing about this, though, as it pertains to software design, is all of these are deployed individually. Um, so something that you hear about a lot in the Rails world is like monolith, right? Everybody hates the, the monorail. And because when you deploy, you deploy the entire code base, and you just have to keep doing that every, every time, right? Um, this is different. You can, you can configure, um, create these releases, 
And if you say that, OK, our cache is really, really getting hit, we need to scale this up. You can either one, you can run more actor, or they're called processes. Again, Erlang's really confusing. Their, their actors are called processes. <laughs> uh, but the big thing is you have a ton of granularity. You can scale all these individually up and down. You can deploy a new node just completely without some of these. Right? It might just be the cache, for example. But when you look at a typical Ruby application, it looks like this. Right? It's like, here's our web server. Like bow down to the web server, right? And everything else. Um, so we think that single-threaded synchronous code is very, very simple, but it's, it's a trade-off that we make, just like any other trade-off. And so we have these applications in Ruby that have this like, crazy distinction. This is part of the web, and this is worker, or everything else. So our code's more simple, but our deployments are made more complex, because we now have different types of processes that we have to deploy, um, different probably different commands to run them, maybe different deployment procedures altogether. So it's just trade-offs. I think in Ruby, we've just decided uh, right now that we're more comfortable making these single-threaded trade-offs than we are the multi-threaded trade-offs. But if you do embrace multi-threading and you do get concurrency, you also get positive trade-offs as well in terms of the granularity over scaling. So to go back to this Elixir design again, These are all executing concurrently. They're all in one code base. It can be scaled individually. So it's, it's very, very modular. And that's what we want in our design. And that's what concurrent design really, really gives you, I feel. And I know this right now. In Ruby, we're trying to fake this kind of design. And it's called this. <laughs> so. We, we want those things, right? We want modularity, we want decoupled things, and we want to scale them individually. Like 90% of the time I talk to someone about service-oriented architecture, it's because they've got some Ruby application, it's deployed 40 times, but it could probably only be deployed 30 times if one piece was deployed 25 times and then the others were for five. So like, okay, well we gotta do services, we gotta start doing this. So you ended up with things that look like this. So now you've added a message queue to the mix once you've figured out what message queue you want, um, and then probably misuse it or get it wrong anyway. And then your, your messages also communicate via HTTP, which is really, really weird, because you wanted to be decoupled, but now you're communicating between your applications using a synchronous request reply model. So you get this like repo-oriented architecture. It's like really what you end up at the end of the day. <laughs> Which is even worse because, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I can't even, like if I have an API in one repository and I have a client for that API in another repository, like I have a hard enough time keeping those things in sync. Like I don't, the last thing I want is five repos that I gotta try and make sure they're all on the same contract. So SOA, the, the whole selling point or the motivation is that you get these force boundaries and you're decoupled and you can scale things individually. But if you use something like Celluloid or a language like Elixir, if you use concurrency, you can do those things, right? It's just like uh, with Elixir, it's, it's like how spicy do I want this one module like on a scale of one to 10? And that's how you, you can have hundreds of thousands of actors just like that. Uh, the other problem with this idea is that going back to processes and concurrency, the only way you can communicate between processes is by using queues. So now you're doing a ton of work over the network instead of doing that in process, which is a lot faster and more reliable. And then to go back to the decoupling, you're not really decoupled if you're using HTTP for, say, your user service to talk to your product service. Right? If, if one of those goes down and the other one needs data from it, you're, you're still very, very coupled. But now you're coupled over the network instead of over the code, which is probably worse. So to recap design, concurrent design, you're forced into modularity from get go, because this is all executed concurrently. If you don't design it well, you're gonna have issues. 
And usually looking for synchronous communication in Elixir app is the first place you start when you are having issues. You can scale everything independently, which is why we like SOA so much. And messaging is really, really hard, so if you can do it in your programming language, in memory, it's, it's a lot easier. And then, of course, the last thing is that it's just programming. Um, when you write an application in Elixir or Erlang, you don't think, oh, this is web, and then this is, is everything else. Web is just one little piece uh, of your application. And finally, I wanted to stick up for Ruby a little bit as it relates to concurrency. Because um, I haven't really picked on the gill at all yet, and I won't. Um, JRuby is actually pretty awesome. There's a talk on it again this year. It's there if the gill is that big of an issue for you. Um, but to understand Ruby, you have to go back to the 90s. And I wasn't around, in, well, I was around in the 90s, but I wasn't you know, using Ruby in the 90s. So let's go back to the 90s. And I think people from Portland and Seattle really like the 90s. <laughs> but I, I want to look at the 1990s programming language design. And this is all speculation. Again, I wasn't around. But if you look at the languages from this period, they all have these things kind of in common. So when you're designing a language, it's almost like you start off picking a paradigm. At the time, it was probably object-oriented. And we've, we chose, or you know, Matt's chose object-oriented. And thankfully, he chose a good version of object orientation, because there's plenty of languages that have really bad implementations of it. And then you decide, all right, are we going to be static? Or are we going to be dynamic? That was, seemed like a really important distinction back then. And then somewhere along the line, you slap some POSIX threads on, which and th that's your concurrency, right? And Ruby didn't even do that from day one. We had that, that green threading implementation. But the, the big point is that when Ruby was designed, Currency it wasn't even on anybody's radar yet, probably. So if we flash forward to 2000s, 2010s, we look at some newer languages. Oh, yeah, it's still the same, huh? <laughs> so style hasn't changed, but I think programming language design has. So if you, if you look at languages now, it goes like this. So step one, choose a concurrency model. Um, some languages maybe didn't do this, but they probably picked some other features that leave this door open for them, right? like immutability. And then from that point on, it's completely about concurrency. You don't want to put something into the language that doesn't support your, one of your key design decisions. And in Ruby, I feel like we tend to think like concurrency and parallelism can work like this. Like, like Matz is just holding out on us, and Ruby core is holding out on us. <laughs> Come on, flip the switch. <laughs> well, it doesn't really work like that, though, because you need a few other things. So number one is you need a good garbage collector. So all of a sudden, if you become parallel and concurrent, if you have a really crummy garbage collector, you're just going to be stopping the world, and you're going to have a bad time anyway. So what was the point? And you can see right now in Ruby, there's a ton of work being put into the garbage collector, right? 2.1. Big change, 2.2 again. And secondly, you need abstractions. Everything I've shown you so far is completely community driven as far as abstractions. Um, just actors and thread pools. We don't have anything in the core or standard library. This is it. With threads, mutexes, condition variables. That's the bare minimum. I mean, it's not often that you're using Ruby and you look at a language like Java and you have envy. But when you look at util.concurrent as a Rubyist, you feel a little bit of envy. So the other pr problem or, or reason why I think Ruby is the way it is right now is that we love simplicity. So we're all using this language because it makes our lives easier or it makes programming fun. And previous languages didn't do that for us. The problem is a lot of what's happening in concurrency right now it's pretty cutting edge. It's from papers from the 70s and 80s, but a lot of those papers were missing implementation details anyway. Right? If, you look at, uh, if you look at a language like Go, and you look at the core team, they have probably about a century of Unix programming experience between them. And if you look at their websites, they have, I think, between five and six implementations of CSP that 
didn't work. So they finally landed on one that works. And these are really, really talented people. So the cutting edge is never simple, right? We can't expect Ruby to have a fantastic concurrency model right now uh, when a lot of other languages have gotten it wrong. I mean, look at Node.js. Like they still want to use an event loop for, for concurrency. So you have, to, you have to watch all these other languages get it wrong first, and then you can finally figure out how to get it right. And I think Matz is finally starting to see that. All right, so he, I don't know why I'm quoting another tweet. I probably looks like a tweet quoter. <laughs> but he's saying he wants to add an abstract concurrency unit, such as actors, and then stop using threads, or warn you, or raise an exception when you use threads directly, and then remove the gill already. So Matz has given us something to look forward to. We just have to, to wait for it. And I think whenever it comes, it'll, it'll be the right abstraction. It'll be simple. So that's all I got. Thanks. <laughs>